So we've all um, experienced those overnight sensations, those stars, how easy it looks from a distance. And then when you spend a moment to study and pay attention to the steps and sequencing that took place up to their discovery, you see how much hard work, in some cases decades, went into that moment of success. So we too have had a visionary with this organization. And 10 years ago, that was Jim Brooks. It remains today, Jim Brooks. And he continued to drive the organization with some fairly simple, straightforward core beliefs, at least the ones that I experienced. They were among the following. It's harder to argue and disagree with someone that you trust and like. So his first goal was to bring people together so they would begin to know each other, like, then trust. Agreement seems to magically purge from those more honest conversations. He also believed that everyone could contribute if given the proper invitation or the proper form framework by which to do so. I've only lived in West Michigan for eight years, and Jim was one of the first people that asked to spend some time with me when I came to town because I had shared a similar role down in Central Florida. But there was an immediate receptivity to those shared experiences and learnings that said, we'll take all those ideas. They will make us better. And probably most important, and this was the moment that this organization had to go through a maturity, was do we need to own it to do good? And we agreed that the facilitation role, the collaboration role, the networking role, the awareness role, the common language role, was a role that we could do particularly well and we didn't need to own or create anything new to do that because the core fabric was in complete existence in West Michigan. It just needed introduced to each other. And with a common language, you can talk to each other. And that was a big concept that Jim guided us through in those very early and formative years. So I want to ask Jim to join me on the stage, if you will. The truth remains that fingerprint, fingerprints fade over time. So the fact that we in West Michigan take a moment to pause and say thank you and remind that while those fingerprints are not apparent to everyone, the effect of the individual that guided this organization to its place today is still here with us, deserves the recognition, and we're different and better because of Jim Brooks' leadership. Thanks, thank you. Help me thank him for what he's done. Well, thank you, Jim. You're most kind in your remarks, and I'm very honored to receive this recognition. Of course, without the talents and the experience of many others, the people that stood up here today, and literally hundreds of others who aren't with us today that were part of the strategic planning process and have contributed their talents to this effort over the last decade. It certainly wouldn't have happened when it did, and the kind of accomplishments that have been achieved wouldn't have happened. What a difference a decade makes. Ten years ago, we led the entire Midwest in job creation. Today, West Michigan faces the most serious economic challenge we've faced since the Great Depression. Since 2001, we've lost 70,000 jobs. Revenues of our businesses have declined significantly, and now these trends are spreading to our governmental units and nonprofit organizations, which threatens to disrupt community services that are critical to our quality of life and our ability to attract and retain talent. Unfortunately, these conditions aren't likely to go away anytime soon. Now, more than ever, our governments, businesses, and institutions must collaborate to revitalize our economy and restore critical revenues and jobs in all three sectors. If you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to share with you a bit of history of my family's business, 
that I think is relevant to all of West Michigan. The Brooks family was in the soft drink business for three generations. My grandfather started in the basement of his home and delivered out of the back seat of his car. And over 65 years, we built one of the premier companies in our industry. But that growth and success was not a nice, smooth curve upward. There were times that we had our strategy in the groove, and then our revenues and our profits grew steadily. But inevitably, competition changed their behavior, made improvements to what they did, or external forces changed that made our strategy much less effective, and then our revenues and profits began to decline. When that happened, we couldn't simply cost cut and job cut our way to renewed prosperity. We had to get very focused on that which was mission critical, reduce or eliminate that which was nice to have, and then we needed to invest in innovation that reestablished the competitive value of our company's products and services. Communities and regions are no different. They too are economic entities that compete for talent and investment capital that helps the economy grow and provides jobs. Without a vibrant economy, we can't generate the corporate and personal incomes, the government tax revenues, the philanthropic resources that we use and are essential to all forms of social progress. Our governments and nonprofits provide services that are essential to our quality of life. However, those costs of those services impose significant cost burden on our businesses that impacts their competitiveness. The world has changed and has disrupted the effectiveness of West Michigan's economic model. So it is essential for our governments and nonprofit organizations, as well as our businesses, to focus on that which is mission critical, to reduce or eliminate the non-essential, and to equally innovate, to maximize productivity and deliver superior value relative to the regions and communities with whom we compete. Through my business experience, I've also learned that times of exceptional challenge and turmoil are also times of exceptional opportunity. For leaders who have a clear vision of the future, the wisdom to set the right priorities, and the courage to make hard choices. Friends, these are very difficult times for every organization in our state and in our region. But these are also West Michigan's opportunity to shine. We have been a role model, and we can even get better in being a role model for others to emulate. Together, we've created a shared vision for this region as the best place to live, learn, work, and play in the Midwest. And that vision is still achievable. The West Michigan Strategic Alliance exists to facilitate essential collaboration in ways that no other organization has been established to do. It exists to encourage innovation in the ways our governments, our nonprofits, and our businesses collaborate within their sectors and across sectors to improve value delivery of our region to the world but the Alliance requires financial resources for the important data gathering, research, convening, and leadership that it provides. Over the past 10 years, WMSA, I think, has demonstrated that it has brought resources and benefits to our region far in excess of the investment that we have collectively made to support this organization. The Alliance continues to have a diverse board of directors representing all three sectors for eight counties. This board constantly challenges itself to focus on the key few initiatives 
that are most relevant to the region's current needs and that will have long-lasting impact on the region and its, lo and its local communities. I'm incredibly proud to have worked with so many amazing people who have generously given of their time and resources to make West Michigan the special place that it is. So I encourage each of you to please stay involved and to encourage others to be involved as well and of course continue that much appreciated financial support. Because now more than ever, we need to work together to give our children and our grandchildren the kind of community that they too can be proud of and continue to build on. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, congratulations to both Jim and Steve for the wonderful leadership that they brought to our organization. I can tell you uh, personally that uh, without their direct involvement to the work that I do and our team does, uh, that we wouldn't be where we are today, and it's, 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 uh, we're fortunate to have people that will step up to the table and provide time and effort to make us what we are as West Michigan. So my special thanks to Jim and Steve for all they do. My thanks as well to Jim Dunlap, uh, who's moving up the leadership, cha the leadership uh, chain here at West Michigan. And um, as you can see, another dynamic leader that's willing to put time and effort into the kinds of work that we're doing there. So we're fortunate to have people of their caliber that are willing to help our region. I want to thank uh, Jeff Gurrell of uh, North Wind Productions. Uh, we don't pay people a lot, but he did a great job with the video, and so we need to acknowledge the great work uh, that was done by Jeff, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to have to go fast today. Uh, we got lots to cover. Um, that's the good news. Uh, not enough time to do it. And uh, as uh, Pam Landis is always telling me, I have great stories to tell, just not enough time to tell the stories. But I, wanted, I do want to start with a story, and this is uh, somewhat of an inside story. I did a survey today, you know, we're doing lots of surveys at WIMSA, and I can tell you that nine out of ten people were happy to see me back in West Michigan having been stuck in Europe because of ash. The other, the other 10, I won't tell you about. Um, we do have a crisis. Uh, we published a document last fall that said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And in fact, I continue to be concerned that we don't understand the consequence of the crisis that we're facing. Michigan receives about $8 billion less in revenue than we received back in 2000. And you don't run the railroad in the same way when you don't have those kinds of resources, and we got to figure out how to get smarter. To bring a little bit of global sense to this process, the Chinese use these characters for crisis. It loosely translates into two ideas, that of danger and opportunity. With the crisis we face does come opportunity, the opportunity to be innovative and to work together in new ways. This is my way to introduce a global reminder to today's discussion. But what we do have to do is we have to accelerate the pace of change. I don't mean to pick on our friends in education, but I'm going to use one example of what we do to ourselves that says to ourselves we need to rethink the way we do work. Is everybody familiar with, the, with count day? You know what we do on count day? We force the superintendents of school systems and other administrators to go stand out on corners and urge parents to make sure that their students get to school so we can physically count them so that then we can allocate resources to their school system based on their presence that one day. The last I knew, the Internal Revenue Service is very happy to have me electronically file my tax return. And if they don't think that I've filed a proper amount, they have things called audits. There's lots of ways for us to verify who's there and who's not there, but count day is a symbol of the past. It's a symbol of not using technology to think, more importantly, about how we do work and how we achieve efficiency at a time when we need to be lean. And so I use it only as an example. I don't mean to pick on our friends in education because they're doing great work, but it's one of those kinds of things that says we need to do work differently and that the past is no longer acceptable as a basis for how we go forth. 
I'm here today because we're accountable to you as the Alliance. We try to do work with the resources we have and we'll report to you the results of the work we've done. We're here today because we need your input and all of you got clickers in front of you. And we're gonna seek your input as we've done in past years because what you have to tell us about our priorities is critical to the work we do. I only got so much time, so many resources and we need to make sure that we get them used in the most appropriate way. And we're here today to make connections. Um, since it's our 10th anniversary, I'm urging each of you to meet 10 other people in this room that you don't know. And you'll have an opportunity to do that at our reception. The way we strengthen our capabilities as a region is by increasing the strength of the collaboration process. So go out and meet 10 people that you don't know. There's people that have passion about the work that we're trying to do and introduce yourselves to them. I'm bringing back to the stage Brenda Vandermeulen from What's the name of your consulting company again? River Hills Consulting, sorry, Brenda. Uh, for those of you who have joined us in previous years, she's a regular feature in this process. Brenda, take it away. Okay. I'm number four, I know. But I'm not on. Is there anybody here who does not have a keypad that they can grab onto right now? Stand up if you're missing a keypad, otherwise we're going to assume everybody's got one. Okay, well, every year we ask you some questions, and I already know that uh, most of you have lied to your mothers, and I already know that you like the Red Wings. So this year we thought we'd ask you a question about the process itself. We'd like to know whether you believe in your gut that what you have to say here is truly anonymous. So we have a simple question. How confident are you that your t responses today are anonymous? Please press one, two, or three. Now, I'm a little concerned about the 9% who are not sure. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking, I don't believe that I know which keypad you picked up. And the only way I could tie your vote to you is if I knew that. So with that, we're going to ask you some questions about who you are. institution. Now I know that 359 answered last time and I was thinking most of you knew where you worked. There we go. Which best describes your role within your organization? Hmm, more of you work there. <laughs> 365 of you have roles that you play. 166. What is your age group? You can ask someone around you um, what they think the estimate is if you think that would be helpful. Are you male or female? 
Again, if you need some help with that one, um, someone I'm sure can help. Votes went in pretty fast. We have two people who are not sure. One is still not sure. Okay. Good thing we didn't put your keypad number up. How do you describe your race and ethnicity? How do you describe it? That, there you go. I just talked to someone who said that uh, her students at Hope College had a hard time filling out the census because they didn't know how to answer this question. We would like to know what, what the makeup of the group is so that we can see how it is changing. And in which county will you be counted for the 2010 census? Hopefully you have already been counted. Three people who don't know. Do you consider yourself to be a decision maker or policy influencer within your organization? One of you is not sure. And is this your first State of the Region meeting? This is our last question. Okay. Um, we have a pretty even spread between business, government, and nonprofit, and education. That's nice to see. Many of you are leaders. I think this is a little more spread out than last year. I think when we take a look at last year's data, we're going to find out that we have younger people here this year, which is terrific. I think this is probably pretty close to the same. And I will tell you that this is the first time since 2007 that the Caucasian group has been under 90%. So that tells us that we are becoming a more diverse group. Canton, Ottawa County, primarily represented. And 87% of you are decision makers. And 40% of you have never come to this meeting before. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. Good. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, Brenda will be with us uh, on and off during the course of the rest of the program. So with that, uh, we're going to continue to move forward. Um, so when I talked to you earlier, I said, let's talk about what we've done. Uh, to deal with the crisis, and so this is the report back uh, part of the process today, and we actually will follow our agenda. The best news is there, um, there is no such, there's not enough time to tell you about everything that's happened. They're just some of the highlights of, of what we've done. And as I've said many times before, WIMSA cannot be the sole source for all regional action, nor should we be. We have a handful of strategic initiatives that we manage, and we, task, and we are each are tasked with making an impact on quality of life in our region. The regional indicators were put in place to help all of us uh, understand if quality of life is better or worse in our region, and we are pleased to share the findings of the report as it will be published in 2010 and covered later in the program. In 2007, this identified educational attainment as a key issue for our, our region. We needed to attract and retain the, the best young people uh, those with bachelor degrees for our region. This led us to creating uh, Intern in Michigan. WIMSA developed this program. We were pleased to announce that 500 new internships have been created in West Michigan and a strong collaboration exists in the region's institutions of higher education, working together to make internships opportunities available. I'm interested by a show of hands, how many of you have been an intern at some point in your career? Wow. Almost uh, 
almost all of the audience. Pretty amazing. Show of hands, how many of you have supervised an intern or had an intern in your organi organization? I think the converted are here. This is good. If you did raise your hand, thanks, and keep up the commitment. This will make a huge difference. If you did not raise your hand, then you need to know this person that we hired called Cindy Brown. Where's Cindy Brown? There she is, back there. If you need to figure out how to do an internship, find a slot for an internship, she's the person you need to reach out and touch. And I can tell you she's doing a great job at this work. The other thing I want to do today uh, is uh, thank the career services directors from each of the colleges and universities. It truly is a collaborative partnership that we put in place to raise the tide for all of us creating more internships for more students in our region. And guess what? The benefactors of this are the employers because uh, there's lots of creative people out there that are bringing new value to this innovative process called West Michigan. Another one of our, uh, and there's some of the, the friendly faces of those people that make that happen for us. Another one of our initiatives is the green infrastructure. Uh, there's a table here where two of the members from the Green Infrastructure Leadership Council are here, Andy Bowman and Dirk Walcotton. Uh, they're here to showcase a new product called the Tool Shed, which is on our website. You'll find the Smart Growth Principles has also been endorsed by the West Michigan Tr Strategic Alliance, and these are listed on the Tool Shed, and they're at the table over here to my right. In 2009, with the help of the Land Policy Institute at MSU, we completed an Ag Economy Report, and we are in the process of completing a strategic plan to grow and support agricultural in, agriculture in West Michigan. Grow, get it, you know, that's part of the economy process here. We, we fostered something in the sustainable manufacturing arena, working with the Right Place Program and the Sustainable Research Group. Uh, under this initiative, uh, more than 21.3 million in cost reductions and environmental improvements have been identified by manufacturers in our region, averaging over $850,000 for each company so it's based on an original investment of less than $7,000 per company. Clean Cities Coalition, another one of our initiatives, is a growing as a public-private partnership to span local markets for alternative fuel vehicles in our region. There's a table for this group uh, over here on my left-hand side. Most of you are aware of uh, Wired. Um, it was a grant that we received back in 2006. We were fortunate as one of 13 regions in the country to receive the grant. The benefits of Wired and the $9.7 million of additional money that's been leveraged uh, has been extremely impactful on the region. Uh, high school juniors, juniors throughout the state now take three work keys tests and our, nation, our region leads the nation in per capita the number of national career readiness certificates that are being issued as a region. We know what our skill levels are, we know how to define those skill levels, and we know how to put it to work for employers. I'm happy to announce um, as well the STREAM. The STREAM is in Nuevo. It's another excellent example. Research showed that highly educated workers in emerging knowledge economy like to be able to live in places like Nuevo and to do business globally. <clears throat> the concept of business centers offering membership into shared office environments, uh, as, uh, into shared office environments as part of a multi-community -converse, conversation. Andy Lofgren, I saw Andy's here, uh, along with other leaders from Nuevo County, took the idea and ran with. The result was the unveiling April 2nd of the St Stream Community Business Center in downtown Nuevo, creating office space and for startups and visiting executives. I'm still negotiating for a West Michigan office in Nuevo. I need to be regional, as you all know, and I really should better understand our region's offering for trout fishing, supposedly world class uh, for the region. It's just one of those things I have to do, you know? Um, probably the thing that will have the greatest consequence for our region as we go forward is something called Talent 2025. The mission of, of this organization is to understand the talent system processes in our regions. It's an employer-led and, and will work collaboratively with leaders in the region's talent development systems in the zero through, K, age, zero, ah, excuse me, in the zero through five age group, K through 12 higher education, incumbent workforce training uh, programs. Together, these leaders will seek to illuminate 
performance gaps in the talent development system, uh, identify and evaluate leading best practices uh, to bridge these gaps, and lastly, to advocate for adoption of certain practices to be taken to scale in the region. Uh, Jim Fisher, I know, is here, who's leading the Talent 2025 effort over here on this side of the organization. Uh, but it's probably one of those things that will help drive our region's success more so than any other. Talent is going to be the thing that makes a difference in terms of region's success, and I, I wish Jim and the others good luck in that effort. We've also uh, been fortunate to win a, a grant recently from the Walmart Corporation. Um, in this case, we were one of seven nationally that were selected to fund what we're now calling Legacy to Work, or I'm sorry, Literacy to Work. It's a program we're doing in partnership with the Grand Rapids Community College and the Literacy Center of West Michigan. Uh, our plan is to take this to all eight counties working in cooperation with not only the Grand Rapids Community College but Muskegon, uh, West Shore and Montcalm Community College as we deal with the literacy issue. In our region we have 130,000 people approximately 25 years of age or older who have no GED, no high school diploma or no certificate and those people basically will not be successful in our economy. The issue of literacy is one that we need to take seriously and now is the time to do it. We're fortunate that the grant from Walmart will help us start to deal with the issue of helping people achieve better performance uh, in those areas. And I look forward to working with the community colleges and the Literacy Center of West Michigan to make this happen. Um, in another area that we've started to work on, inter intergovernmental collaboration. When WIMSA was started 10 years ago to encourage more collaboration amongst governmental units, um, we've now finally reached the point where hopefully this will take off. In 2009, we began talking to leaders from the counties, cities, and townships in the regions about new ways to work together. One of the ideas that was common to many of our stakeholder meetings was the idea of pooling purchasing power for local units of government to purchase commodities. We're pleased to say that Daryl DeLabio has the solution. Daryl, where are you? There he is. Well, not exactly Daryl, but the people at Kent County's IT folks have implemented a reverse auction process uh, for purchasing commodities. They're in the process of sharing the system with local units of government in Kent County, and we expect to broaden it to the entire region later this year. My estimate is if we could uh, all participate in this, we'll save four to five million dollars per year in purchasing costs by collaborating to a system that will allow governments to transparently pipe buy commodities in a much more effective way. It's a very exciting program. I thank Daryl and the Kent County people for their leadership in this area. I also want to identify other regional actions. Um, as I said to you, West Michigan was never, Strategic Alliance never intended to be the sole source for regional action. There's lots of wonderful work that's going on as a result of the regional mindset that's been created. Uh, one of those is, um, oops, I skipped over. One of those is Leadership West Michigan. It's a program of the West Michigan Chamber Coalition created in 2003, right after the birth of the Common Framework, which is a document that WIMSA produced to design and equip leaders for regional collaboration. Participants are introduced to a variety of national, regional, and local experts and issues and encouraged to explore interrelated systems and challenges defining West Michigan. Uh, quick question, how many West Michigan, Leadership West Michigan graduates do we have in the room today? So you can see an important program. Uh, Julie Metzger is here today from Leadership West Michigan and has a table and they're looking for students to participate in next year's class. So if you're interested in joining uh, the class, please see Julie. Um, I'm really pleased to announce the work that we've been doing with LIDA. Uh, WIMSA continues to look at diversity and inclusion as a top priority for West Michigan. We're pleased to partner with the Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance on their summit for ra racism coming up on May 20th at Hope College. Uh, Gail Harrison from LIDA is here, and I know Gail has a booth set up over here on the right side. Good to see you today, Gail. Uh, she'd be happy to give you some registration material and looks forward to your participation. We've been spending time as well with the Partners for a Racism-Free Community. Lisa Mitchell's here from Grace. Where are you, Lisa? Oops, I'm sorry. Good, good to see you, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. Um, 
And lastly, we've recently entered into an agreement with the People of Color Collaborative to assist in this important work by convening meetings and providing administrative support. If you're interested in learning more about the People of Color Collaborative or would like to get involved, uh, please go see us at the WIMSA table, which I think is on my left-hand side. I want to, at this point, uh, also acknowledge the special work of Ted Parsons, uh, who deserves a lot of recognition for the leadership that he's providing for our organization in this area. We're a small group, uh, and we can't function unless all of the members of the team are actively engaged in the kinds of work we're doing, and Ted has stepped up to this whole issue of diversity, and I can't thank him enough for what he's doing for, to represent us in this area. Another initiative is Queris. Um, if you can pronounce it, you're off to a great start. Uh, Queris is a regionally based collaborative effort to attract and retrain skilled and qualified talent to the region. It was started through the West Michigan Chamber Coalition. But more importantly, some of our leading businesses recognize the importance of collaboration in this effort. Queris offers a public website, hellowestmichigan.com, that tells the story of why West Michigan and our unique communities are a great place to live, work, learn, and play. Uh, Kevin Stotz is here, and he's got a table over here on this side. Kevin, good to see you. Um, lastly, uh, and I could go on uh, for a long time covering the various kinds of initiatives, I want to take a minute to, to acknowledge probably the, one of the most critical things that's happened in our region as relates to, to a resource and an asset that's important to our region. At the mouth of the Kalamazoo River, there's 171 acres of magnificent dunes with long stretches of white sand and a small inland lake and at least six rare plants and animal species in the Saugatuck Harbor Nature Area. The city of Saugatuck records uh, show that their interest in acquiring the property stretches back as far as 1952 and the Land Conservancy of West Michigan has been working to acquire the property since 1994. It was identified in WIMSA's first action report in 2003 as a critical natural resource. In late 2009, the land was purchased by the Land Conservancy of West Michigan and with successful completion of the fundraising, it will be transferred to the city of Saugatuck over the next three years. The Land Conservancy is here and Pete Holmeyer is uh, over here to my right. Peter, uh, congratulations to you and all the others that help make this happen. This is truly, I need to say, this is truly a regional accomplishment. There's, there's uh, too many people for me to announce uh, that should be recognized for actually making this happen, but these are one of the kinds of things that, that meet the threshold test of what's critical to achieving long-term success as relates to quality of life in our region, and the Sagatuck purchase is one of those, and we appreciate the great effort there. Now, if I take a pause here for a minute, catch my breath real quickly. That's the list of things that are going on in West Michigan. I can't read all of the other things that are going on, but I think hopefully you're pleased to see the kinds of work that's occurring and the way we're trying to build partnerships to make this happen. When I joined the Alliance in late 2005, um, one of the first questions that um, I asked was, how do we measure our performance? How do we know that tomorrow will be better than yesterday? And in what ways do we have to evaluate their performance as it relates to measuring and testing our quality of life? And the regional indicators was a process that we started uh, in, back in 2006. Thanks to a diverse group of stakeholders who participated in the development of our 2015 achievement targets and key drivers, we now have a set of targets to, to look at relative to benchmarks as it relates to 26 other regions of the country, relative to current data that says, here's where we are and here's what the trends are for the data. As I alluded to earlier, this is what triggered our start uh, down the road of internships. We looked at our region and, and in terms of the number of people with BA degrees or higher, 25 years of age to 34 years of age, we were less than the state average and less than the national average, and yet we say we need to be intellectually capable to be successful as a region, and internships was an action coming out of the review of the data that said this is what we need to do and this is what we need to tackle this problem. Data drives action. 
And in the case of the work of the West Michigan Strategic Alliance, we use data as the, as the underpinning for all of the work we do as a rationale for how to go forward. This year, we, for the first time, are able to look at ourselves in terms of how we compare to other uh, regions across the, the uh, United States. And George, Aircheck, and others will talk more about this process. But taking into, into account the performance of each region on the indicators that are available, West Michigan has an overall rank of ninth out of 27. So this is pretty good company. We're in the top third in the country for our region as it relates to our performance and economic, social, environmental uh, capability. We're in the top third, uh, we're, in the, we're number six as it relates to our social performance, and we're number 10 as it relates to our environment, I'm sorry, I reversed those. We're number six for our environmental performance, and we're number 10 for our social performance, it's our economic performance that's dragging us down, no surprise. We're number 17. But when you look at the aggregate of all of these, to be in what I say the top third of the country for the reasons that we, we should look to uh, for advice and consult about how well we're doing, I think we should feel pretty good about where we are and, and what we've been doing and what we need to do on a go-forward basis. So at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Pam Landis, who will take us through the next steps of this process. Thank you. Pam's my long-term partner in this process. So. <laughs> well, you can't, you're going to leave me that. Uh, everybody got a copy of the vital signs when you came in today? And uh, as you might expect, it is impossible to quantify West Michigan in 18 measurements, but we made a good stab at it. Um, you're going to need this document when we go through the next set of speakers here. Uh, so pull this out, and there's some sticky notes on your table. You're going to need those, too. As you go through this with George Erichek from the W.E. Upjohn Institute, John Vandermolen from the Annis Water Resources Institute, and Jeremy Pine from the Community Research Institute, you're going to want to think about the items that are on this piece of blue paper at your table. There's three questions at the bottom of that page. And they ask you, which one of these indicators represents an area that's going to have the most impact for our region? Which one of these is most ready for regional action? Which one of these do you personally feel most committed to? Where would you put your time and resources? So use those sticky notes to note your ideas as these three guys lead you through the process. And in addition to myself and those gentlemen, I want to recognize Connie Bellows from Conversation Matters, who was also part of the team who put this together. And that brings us to George, who will tell you about the economic indicators. Good afternoon. Um, let's start with economics, although we know that this is the one field that we have to do some work on. First of all, before we look at the data, we have to think about what was the criteria that we used for the data. Well, reliability was important, so we used the census, uh, EPA, uh, the DNR, and other very reliable sources. Uh, comparability, we were comparing ourselves with other communities, so we had to make sure we compare them. Geographic coverage, maintenance, updating, all the data we'll be showing you has is 2006-2008 data. So it's fairly current. And finally, it has to be cheap. Okay, so let's take a look. Oops, that was too fast. This is tricky. There we go. Okay, the first indicator I'd like to look at is self-employed professionals. Why do we pick this? We picked this because we thought this was an indicator of entrepreneurship and innovation. We're looking at those who really are, have talent and have the courage to be on their own. And here the news is good. Compare ourselves to Michigan, compare ourselves to the U.S. However, I would suggest to you that that's not the right comparison. As a matter of fact, I think we should stop picking on Michigan. We should pick, pick on someone our own size. And so therefore, we picked 26 peer regions. These regions had to have five counties or more. 
Uh, because we have eight. The hand have two or more major core areas, because we have three, at least three. We, of course, we have Holland, Muskegon, and Grand Rapids. And the population had to fall within 375,000, 2.2 million. Plus, we stayed away from such areas as Florida, California, and Colorado. Who needs them? <laughs> okay, so going back to self-employed, where did we sit? Number sixth. Uh, so this is really good news. What's the driver? Well, training. But more importantly, one thing we have to think about is venture capital opportunities so that we can provide financing for these entrepreneurs. What's the next indicator we looked at? Education achievement, what I think is one of the most important. And we're also very interested about 25 to 34 year olds because these are the people that are gonna be in the future directing our region. And here, this was never. it's not as good. You can see that we are still lagging behind the Mich Michigan in the U.S. Uh, why is this? Well, what's, what's the driver? Well, I think as we look at where we stand with their peer group, we rank number 15. I believe that talent goes to areas that demand talent. So that's number one. We have to have businesses, we have to have industries that demand talent. Number two, we have to have the amenities that young people want to see. I think this is a great place to live. I think we just have to get the information out. But still, 15th and lagging behind Omaha is simply not acceptable. <laughs> per capita income. For an economist, this is probably the most important measure we can do. It's an overall performance measure. You can see that we're improving, but once again, we're lagging the state and we're lagging the U.S. It's not surprising because it's so tied to education. How are we doing here? 19th. Good paying jobs as a driver and training programs that allow individuals, allow our neighbors and our friends to climb up their career ladders. And by next year, we should be able to beat Providence. But indeed, it's employment change that is one of the worst hit. Uh, you can see that this has been a very brutal time uh, for West Michigan. Uh, this has hit us harder than any other area. And in fact, when we look at ourselves among the 26th, we're dead last. Clearly, this is a call for action. This is a call for more business dynamics, more entrepreneur, more business growth, and also more innovation. But at the same time, we have employment change. We also have employment rate, which is a strange term, I know, but it's a term that we've been using because we did not like, I did not like, we did not like the unemployment rate. Because the unemployment rate doesn't include those that have given up looking for work. It doesn't include those working age adults that simply are not part of the workforce. So instead, what we want to look at is percent of 16 year olds and older who are working. We think that's a better indicator. And this looks good. Look how we are compared to the state and the nation. More importantly, take a look at where we are with the top performers. And again, we're up there at 10th place. However, we can't touch Des Moines, 70%, Salt Lake City at 68%. The driver here, well, the driver here is strong workforce intermediaries and training. Are we doing a good job in connecting people who want to work with the jobs that they can do? And can we provide the training necessary for them to do that job well, and more importantly, advance in their careers? And then our final indicator on economic well-being are kids. It's a percent of kids living in poverty. And here, the news is better uh, than what we've seen in the, in the state in the U.S. Uh, it's a proxy for economic opportunities to all. Uh, and it's an it's, it's a area that will, it's a group, kids living in poverty, that will face challenges. Challenges that we will have to come to grips with in the next 15 or 20 years. Again, how do we compare? We're number 12th. So all in all, we know that this is a great place to live. We know that this economy can do better. 
And I think these indicators properly measure those characteristics that we want to monitor. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Right. Am I on? Yes. Great. Very quickly, hopefully you used those stickies and you made notes of those that you felt would have the most impact, are the most ready for an initiative, and that you're committed to. So three quick questions. Which of those indicators, self-employed professionals, number one, educational attainment, so forth, has the greatest potential to impact the quality of life in the West Michigan region? One, two, three, four, five, or six. And which has the most receptive, is most receptive or ready for regional action? Where would you spend your time or money? And as you're finishing up on that, I'm going to ask John to go ahead and come up and talk about the next set. We will show you these results at the end. All right. All right, uh, it's always easier going after George because the economy is so bad, and so it really makes me look good. Um, I always get really excited when I see uh, a room full of people from all over the community with different backgrounds trying to make the region and my home and my kids' home um, a lot better. So thank you. You guys should be proud of yourselves. Um, as Brenda said, my name is John Vandermolen, which fits in good in a good Dutch West Michigan community like we have here. Uh, more specifically, I am a researcher at the Annis Water Resources Institute in Muskegon uh, for Grand Valley State. We have six environmental indicators, which is good news because that's more than last year, but bad news for y'all because you got to listen to me talk more. So pretty much the only one that carried over from last year is closed beach days. Uh, closed beach days is, is the number of days closed due to excess levels of E. coli, which is kind of an indicator bacteria key driver of what makes them so high, so the 1.14 in 2008 to the 2.99 is animal waste. So every time you see like Canadian geese or you walk your dog and you don't pick up after it, um, it's a huge economic crisis if, for having 2.99 closed beach days per beach monitor. We measured 71 beaches in West Michigan, 212 closed beach days, an annual loss of $31 per person that comes to visit those days per year. So it has large economic consequences. Well, how do we do compared to other people in the region? I couldn't tell, or the 26 regions, I couldn't tell you. Because to measure against regions that don't have our resource base um, with the lakes, with everything we have, isn't just, can't do it. And so we only measured between the three regions in the West Michigan area are in the Lake Michigan Basin and we come out number two which we were number one last year so we're going to move on to PBTs this is kind of um, a new one um, for those of you who don't know they're persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals it's a group of 20 chemicals subclasses and they're, they can, they're not good um, if you think of what they are think of mercury think of PBCs think of lead and if you think about the small fish that eats the, the seaweed and the little algae, and you think about the big fish that eats that small fish and how we eat that big fish, you can imagine that it's, um, it's going to build up. So that's the B, the bioaccumulative, and the T is obviously toxic. Nothing good ever comes after toxic. So, <laughs> so uh, as you can see on our graph, um, in 2001, we were really, really high. And in 2007, we kind of bottomed out, and we're going up a little bit, but by no means is that a trend. Uh, come back next year, and we'll see if it continues to go up. Um, I can tell you a key driver of that is going to be um, electric generation. And in fact, I can tell you, based on research I did today, that 99.9% .9 of that comes from lead and mercury. Well, how does that perform against the other 26? We are 10th with 52,000, a little bit over, 
Um, Des Moines is just doing outstanding. Dayton, which is kind of a comparable region in the Midwest. So we can really look for them for best management practices to really bring that number down. Next indicator that we have is average commute time, which is basically the amount of time it takes you to go home to get to work. Why do we measure this? Well, we measure this because it's a general bellwether um, for us based on some research we did, and that's kind of scientific talk for, for people like me. Um, just to say, or, you know, we, we look at it as a bellwether for urban sprawl, related pollution. Um, uh, I'll admit my commute isn't the best. It's a little bit over the 21.8. Um, key driver of that is urban sprawl. So the closer you can live to downtown or your workplace, it, the better. Compared to the 28 other regions, we are two and a half minutes between Omaha. And if Pam didn't tell me I didn't have a lot of time, I would sit here and let you guys just sit quiet for two and a half minutes, but um, I'm pretty sure someone would rush the stage. Um, next is we, gotta, we really got to look at our type two municipal solid waste, and that's kind of jargon, so let me make it easier for you. It's trash. Uh, if you throw it away at home, your cardboards, your plastics, your food waste, or other inorganic waste, that is what we're generating. And you can see that it's 6.1 Pounds per person per day, which is better than Michigan. So uh, what can you do? I mean, you think of the, you know, this is kind of an idea of, wow, let's recycle more. Well, what about the other three, two R's? Let's reduce. Let's reuse. Let's find different ways. Let's think outside the box. How is that compared to other people? Well, we look like we're number 13. There's a little disclaimer on this. It's only out of 17. So we're, we're really not doing that great. But as you can see from the other chart, we're consistently going down. So that's something that you know, we can all be proud of. Next indicator is, these next two are gonna be air indicators. Um, the first one is ground level ozone. And I'll make it easy for people. You know, you think ozone, wow, why is that bad? Why should we watch that? Well, ozone up high, good. Ozone nearby, bad. So it's actually a pollutant when it's really you know, close to the earth, but when it's really high up, we like it. It's cool. And um, a key driver of ground level ozone as a pollutant, which is a main ingredient in smog, is how far we drive. So you can kind of see how this ties in to other indicators that we have, such as average commute time. Bring that down, you're bringing ozone down ozone down. How is West Michigan doing? We are currently below the attainment level. Um, pretty good since we've been a little inconsistent through this decade. Um, I can tell you that we are actually, not we, but the, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is bringing those standards down. So they're going to get better. Well, they're going to go down to 60, which is that very bottom bar. So we can kind of think about ourselves for next year that we're actually going to be above that. So there is going to be work to do on that. And obviously carpooling and accepting other forms of transportation um, is going to be a big part of that. How are we doing compared to other areas? Um, with air, it is a large regional issue. So teaming up with other areas in West Michigan and with other areas such as Milwaukee, number four, we're a lot of people that I talk to think that we get our air quality from is going to be imperative. So additional regional collaboration outside of Michigan. But we rank eighth, so that's pretty good. Next we have particulate matter 2.5. Um, 2.5 is guess kind of, well, what does that mean? Well, that's micrometers. So think about your average hair size. That's 70 micrometers. So it's a, the hair is about 30 times bigger than these particles. So you can imagine if you're going through a cloud of particulate matter for whatever reason you think you have to do that. Um, it's going deep into the lungs and it's causing irregular heartbeats. Uh, it's causing lung issues. Um, the good news is that we're well below the attainment level for this one. In fact, with the 27 different regions, we're, we're 12th, but uh, that's kind of, I'm gonna tell you this little tidbit. Everybody above us 
is mostly west of us. If you look at Boise City, Portland, Salt Lake City, the top three, where are they? They're out west. They're getting most of their clean air off the ocean. So um, we can be proud of 12 because we're below the standard. Uh, with those, when those indicator, with the last two indicators, I have to do a little disclaimer that those are monitor averages and it's really, really important to track those individual air monitors throughout Kent, Ottawa, Muskegon, Allegan counties to see the distribution of pollution in the community. And um, I guess I'm turning it over to Brenda, but uh, as kind of a last remark, um, it's going to be you guys that make the difference at your business, at your home. So it's really going to be a grassroots effort. So keep up the good work, and um, if you have any questions, I'll be around the stage afterwards. Thank you. Okay, again, I hope you have uh, kept track of those as you went along. Closed beach days, PBT chemicals, commute time, uh, type two solid waste, ground level ozone and particulate matter. And again, the same three questions. Which is the greatest potential to impact the quality of life in the area? Which represents the area most ready for change and ready for regional action? And where would you like to spend your time or money? Again, I will be showing you the results a little later, but I'm going to turn it over at this point to Jeremy Pine, Jeremy Pine from the Community Research Initiative to talk about the last set of indicators. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to talk about or to cover the six social indicators that are here in this year's vital signs report. Uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, we here in West Michigan uh, rank 10th overall for social indicators, so that's pretty good. Okay, the first, the first social indicator we're going to cover is the uh, no health care coverage. Uh, this tracks measure, this, this measures population between the ages of 18 to 64 that have no form of health care coverage, so that includes any sort of employee benefits, uh, any prepaid plans, or government plans. Uh, West Michigan, we fell at 12.9%. So to put that into perspective, if you're at a table with about eight people, one person in that table would not have health insurance. Um, and overall, across our 26 regions, we scored seventh. That's pretty good. Uh, Des Moines is at the top with 10.5% that don't have health and care coverage. Um, there's a couple indicators here I also wanted to mention in the social that we're going to be seeing some changes in and we'll have to see how that affects upcoming reports. Uh, and those changes are happening at the state and federal level. Uh, and with no health care coverage, uh, obviously that's the uh, recent developments with health care reform. So we'll have to see, see how that takes shape and how that affects these indicators. Next up, we have median income by race. Uh, here we're, we're measuring the racial disparity based on median income. Um, what, what we had to do is we had to make use of an index so that we could compare this, uh, not only with the state and the US, but also across our 26 regions. So I'll, I'll quickly try to explain that. Uh, each region is given a score based on how, how, um, how much disparity exists with their median incomes uh, by race. So uh, if a region scores a zero, Right? That means that regardless of, um, if the region scores zero, it means all people, regardless of their race, are, are, have the same median income. So if we have a region that has their white population scoring at about, uh, scoring a median income of, of 40,000, and let's say their Hispanic population is at 30,000, they have this much disparity between their incomes. Now, if we have another region that the white population has 50,000, 
we have a much larger amount of disparity. So each, each one of those disparities then puts it into a score. So and if, uh, for West Michigan, our, we, had, we scored at a 24.5. So the higher it goes, the higher score you get, the worse it is, the more disparity that we're seeing. Um, and that's up last year from 21.5, so we're getting worse. And if you look, we also have surpassed the U.S. now for our score and are getting pretty close to, to um, surpassing the state as well. So um, this, is, this is an area that we really have to pay attention to. And when we compare to our 26 regions, uh, we, we are scored at 13th overall. Okay, next up is voter participation. Uh, this, this is an indicator that we can track on even years to make it, uh, to have comparable data, we have to track it on even years, so we're looking at the 2008 presidential election. Uh, the next report will look at the election coming up this November. Uh, so with the, the 2008 general election, uh, we're measuring the percentage of registered voters who cast a ballot in that election. Um, one thing that we noticed is that uh, we have the same percentage between the 2004 election and the 2008. Now, the reason for this is, in 2008 we did have a, a, a big increase in the amount of registered voters, but we also had a big increase in the amount of people that cast ballots. So both of those increased, but we still got the same percentage of people that came out to vote from the 2004. And when we compared to our 26 regions, we uh, came in 14th overall. And we, looked up, we look at Portland and Milwaukee, both above 80%. That's pretty impressive for voter participation. That's really high. The next indicator we tracked is housing cost burden. So this is the percent of homeowners and renters. This year we, we had, uh, uh, included renters into this number as well that are paying 30% or more of their income for housing costs. So it doesn't matter if you make 10,000 a year or if you make 200,000 a year, you'd be included in this number if 30% of your income is going towards your housing costs. Uh, for Michigan, one in three people are in housing that is considered unaffordable. We are doing better than the state or the nation, um, but overall, we rank 20th out of our 26 regions. This was one I, I think that we were pretty surprised last year. We we ranked the same last year. We, we were pretty surprised back then, and, and we got the same results this year. Um, and we don't I don't think we really know why we're scoring so low, other than you might be able to tie it to some of, of how we ranked with that economic indicators like per capita income uh, might be directly affecting this indicator as well. So this is definitely one where we need to we need to improve. For teens not in school, this is our education indicator. Uh, we're looking at population between the ages of 16 to 19 that are not in school and don't currently have a high school, uh, high school diploma. Here we're showing improvement. We're down to 5.2% from 5.5. Uh, we are doing better than the state and the US, but, and all three of those are getting better. Um, and this year we when we compare across our 26, we're falling just short of the top five. We're in sixth place, so that's 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 very good. Um, this is another indicator that we might be seeing some change in the uh, end of last year, the end of 2009. The race to the top reform was passed, and that's going to that's upping the dropout age from 16 to 18. So we'll have to see how that ends up affecting affecting this indicator here locally. And the uh, the first the first group of people that will be experiencing that reform will be the graduated, uh, people graduating in 2016. And our last indicator is crime rate. Uh, here we're looking at the number of violent and property offenses per 100,000 people. Uh, what, the, what the police department does is it takes offenses and it categorizes them um, as either violent or property crimes. Uh, here we, uh, with our violent crime we stayed level 344 violent crimes per 100,000 people. So to put that into perspective, we have, if we have about 450 people in here, that would be one violent crime per this population. Uh, for property crime, we, we decrease significantly. Uh, 
we had 2,700 property crimes per 100,000. That's down from 2,900 last year. Uh, so again, with 450 people, 2,700 property crimes per 100,000. With 450 people, that's about 13 property crimes per this population. And we have continued to have better rates than the state. And crime rate is, is a data set that we don't, have, we don't have access to any comparable data across the region, so this is one we couldn't benchmark for our 26 regions. Okay. okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda. All right, last set of questions. And again, if you uh, have your keypads ready, the six real quickly. We're going to look at, again, for impact, um, readiness, and your commitment. No health care coverage, median income, voter participation, housing costs, burden, teens not in school crime rate. Which of those has the opportunity to impact quality of life the most? And um, I didn't know that was going to come up. Sorry about that. Um, most receptive to or ready for regional action? Means they're all going to come up, unfortunately. So. and where you would personally be willing to spend your time or money. And actually you can switch screens now while those are still coming in. And Pam, go ahead. All right. Uh, I want to thank anyone in here who participated as a stakeholder in developing the indicators this year. We had wonderful turnout, and one of the things you asked for and we listened was to see more demographic breakdown of the data. So if you haven't had enough information to, at this point, uh, we're going to set you off on a course here, and when you, when you begin talking to one another, take a look at pages 9 and 19, They'll figure into your thinking as well. That gives you a closer look at those indicators that had information available to do on a, a racial ethnic breakdown. So I'm starting to see a little glazed over look out there. And it, although, uh, you know, everyone tells us it takes a region to compete globally, it takes both sides of your brain to do some good thinking. So go with me here. Simplest way to activate both sides of your brain is to cross over. So sitting at your table, cross over one hand to this knee, the other hand to this knee. Go with me. Come on. You can do it. It's almost like marching, and you're not even going anywhere. Oh, Al's doing double time. He's doing this. All right, so let's take a look at the results. Um, we will have the most impact, uh, most ready, and uh, most committed for each section of the indicators. There's a lot of energy, a lot of interest behind educational attainment. That's not a surprise. We've seen that the last couple of years here. There's a lot of impact to the commute time, a lot of uh, readiness, and a lot of commitment behind solid waste, more impact to the housing cost burden, and a lot more uh, readiness and uh, commitment to those teens not in school. All right, next challenge. On your table, you will find one index card. One, only one. If you found it, hold it up. Good, very good. Okay, you just became the scribe for your table. All right. On your index card. You will notice there is one small number written on your index card that corresponds to, could we go back to Brenda's list, please? 
corresponds to those numbers, one through nine. I have a seven here, so if I were at your table with my card, we'd be talking about housing cost burden. All right, if you have a four, you'll be talking about commute time. Pretty simple, if you've got one, two, or three, you'll be talking about educational attainment. This card is very important. This is your input device, very technologically advanced. What you're going to do is you're going to have about 10 minutes or so at your table to do some deliberating, and you have this much space to express your idea of the best regional action to address the number that's on your card. All right, so I have a seven. My table would be looking for one suggestion, the best regional action we could take to address housing cost burden. One, one idea on one card per table. When you've finished, you can drop it into the triangular structure on your table and we'll pick them up afterwards. So take your 10 minutes and we'll call you back to order. to introduce uh, Margo Berta, who's going to introduce our main speaker. Margo. Hi, my name is Margo Berta, and I'm a student at Aquinas College, majoring in sociology. I had, <laughs> I had the honor of taking part in the Kent Allegan County uh, Michigan Works Mes West Michigan Strategic Alliance Internship Program, where I accepted an internship at Girls Inc. at the YWCA. Um, I worked with some amazing women, inspire inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Um, working with the Girls Inc. program has been a great learning experience, and I hope that it helps me in grad school and my future career. Um, I have been asked to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mr. Samuel Lichen, and Mr. Lichen is Vice President at the Council on Competitiveness. Prior to coming to the Council, he served as a Senior Policy Analyst in the Division of Social, Economic, and Workforce Policy at the National Governors Association Center for Best Practices. A graduate of Columbia University, Mr. Lichen holds a Master of Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government of Harvard University and a Journeyman Machinist License from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It is my distinct honor to present to you Mr. Samuel Lichen. I've been asked to condense my remarks. Therefore, you're going to miss a really funny joke. <laughs> but if you see me, if you see me afterwards, I'll tell you the joke, uh, and you may be paying a very, very strict penalty. What I want to talk about is something called turning competitive advantage into collab disadvantage into collaborative advantage. This is based on a study that the Council on Competitiveness did for the Economic Development Administration on the issue of regional leadership. A couple of words about regional leadership. Nobody knows anything about it. Ours is probably the only report that's ever been done, so you're looking at the world's expert for better or for worse. Regional leadership and the whole problem of regions or the whole issue of regions is a very distinct and different problem. Why? Well, there's a lot of study at universities on corporate leadership, on government leadership, on NGO leadership. All of those have one thing in common or a couple of things in common. They have a structure. They have officials who are elected or appointed or in some ways designated to make decisions. Regions have none of that. Regions don't even have a definition. So when you're talking about regional leadership, you're clearly talking about a very different kind of an animal, and this is the, the problem that we were trying to address. Uh, oh, somebody did that for me. Did I do that? Magic. Uh, 
Let me tell you just a little bit about the Council on Competitiveness. We're in Washington, D.C., which means we're inside the Beltway, forgive us. Uh, we try and cure that disease by getting outside the Beltway to places like Grand Rapids. Uh, the Council has worked in 35 regions around the country since we began our regional innovation initiative in 1999 with the publication of Clusters of Innovation, which we did with Michael Porter. The Council itself was originally a commission appointed by President Reagan back in the day when we were worried about Germany and Japan eating our lunch. Some of you in the audience are old enough to remember that. Unlike most things the government creates, the commission went away. Uh, but the chair of the commission named John Young, who was the former CEO of Hewlett Packard said, gee, there's nobody else looking at the issue of productivity and how we grow our economy. Let's keep this going. So he created the council as a nonprofit, nonpartisan, and most importantly, tripartite organization. In some ways, we're like the West Michigan Strategic Alliance because while we're a leadership organization, we are comprised of leaders from three sectors private businesses, CEOs, presidents of colleges and universities, and labor leaders. The reason that that's important is A, there's nobody like us in Washington, D.C., and B, we like to think that it gives us a somewhat different perspective. Instead of representing the special interests of each of these groups, putting these three together produces, we like to think, and I think it works this way, uh, a view of kind of the general interest, what's good for the country, and with all the partisanship and haggling that goes on in D.C., people who are trying to rise above that uh, and look at the overall general interest are a rare commodity. What do we do? Well, what we really care about most is wealth creation, because if you don't got the wealth, you don't got the wages. So the primary thing the council started to look at was productivity. How do we increase productivity? Uh, we also then began to see, well, if we're gonna increase productivity in the modern world, uh, we can't compete as a low wage, low cost nation. That makes no sense. The only way we can compete is through innovation. So the second of our priorities after productivity is innovation and then the third is increasing our living standards. And we think the way to increase our living standards is not to fight over the pie, but to build a bigger pie or to bake a bigger pie. See if I can do this. Hey, ooh, I'm too good at it. This is the United States at night. It's my favorite slide. I use it all the time, even when I'm, not ta when I'm talking to my kids, I use it. The reason is it's a really good way to understand that the United States is a nation of regions because all of those clusters of lights that you see are regions seen at night and if you look carefully, which is hard to do on this particular map, but they overlap political jurisdictions. And that's probably the key problem as we were looking at regional leadership that arose. We are a country whose jurisdictional regions and economic regions do not coincide. So therefore, when we make regional decisions, which we have to do all the time on all kinds of major issues, we don't have a decision-making process that works as fast as business works. So this is the fundamental problem that we looked at when we're trying to deal with how to understand regional leadership. Why regional leadership? Why is that so important? Well, it's important because regions in this day and age have to act collaboratively, they have to act like regions, especially because we're at a disadvantage, as I cited earlier. There are lots of countries in the world where their political jurisdictions match their economic uh, <clears throat> regions, and therefore they can make their decisions more quickly, and more importantly, they can round up their assets and focus their assets on problems more quickly. That makes them more competitive in a global environment. And so what we decided to do is to figure out where the effective leadership was in this country. Now, 
we didn't have a tremendous amount of money. We couldn't look everywhere. Uh, but we looked around and we wanted to do th two things. Find effective leadership and find diverse regions because what our hope and expectation is, is to have people look at this and sort of say, oh, okay, Danville, Virginia, that's a rural region. We're a rural region. Maybe there's something we can learn from Danville. Uh, well, why did we pick West Michigan? I know that's the question that's on your mind. It's not because, by the way, there was a little bit of false advertising, I hate to say this, because it's not because you're necessarily a best practice region, although I think you are, because we didn't do a best practice study, right? It's because you have effective leadership, right? There are a couple of things that particularly stood out as we looked at West Michigan. Uh, and um, in the interest of full disclosure, as the journalists like to say, we've known the West Michigan Strategic Alliance for a long time. We worked with you during the Wired uh, activities. Uh, we worked with you prior to that in a West Michigan summit. So we have a sense of what's been going on here and we've been able to follow it over, over time. Uh, plus you represent an interesting phenomenon. You all ha have expressed it through the uh, 20, was it 26 regions that you counted around the country that are similar to yours. In other words, you represent, just like Danville represents a rural region, you represent a multi-centered region uh, and there are any, any number of them. But what we really learned from you were a couple of things. The most important was data-driven decision-making. Uh, you had to sit through all this data uh, and, you know, you can't kid me, I was here, some people yawned, we know who you are. Uh, but the data matters, right? Because as the old expression goes, <clears throat> what you get, what you measure. Uh, and the fact that you have put such an emphasis on this ranks you up there with what we think is the leading uh, regional uh, body in the country, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, right, who also have been doing the exact same thing, putting together a series of measures, measuring their, pro their uh, progress, and more importantly than measuring it, disseminating it, right? Just as you are meeting here, Every year, the Silicon Valley holds, uh, the Joint Venture Silicon Valley holds the community meeting with about a thousand people, it's a little bigger than you are, that discuss, discusses the measures and discusses what their priorities should be. So this issue of metrics figured very, very importantly in our study. Um, the second thing that was really important to us was this notion of a regional mindset or a regional identity. Uh, from your earliest documents, the common framework on, you have focused on this. Why does this matter? Well, because regions are unnatural. Um, we call regional collabora collaboration an unnatural act among non-consenting adults. Uh, <laughs> people don't usually say they're from a region. They say they're from Grand Rapids. Uh, they're from Holland. Not too many people probably say they're from West Michigan. So since it's not natural, the identity that you create has to be reinforced and reinforced constantly. And you'll see later that we think this is one of the key tasks of regional leadership to keep that identity going because if you're going to have collective action, you've got to have a regional identity. Uh, we also talked a little bit in our study about what we call the three C's of regional collaboration. Uh, the first is conversation. Uh, we had the privilege of talking to uh, some folks from the local newspaper this morning and um, the publisher said, well, you know, we've encountered around this region that there's an ongoing conversation. And that's absolutely true everywhere, that there's an ongoing conversation. People care about the issues. The problem is that how do you make this conversation relevant? How do you make the conversation lead to action? Well, you have to have a committed organization that's conducting that conversation and it takes many forms. Some places do visioning exercises where they go around their region uh, and uh, hold forums in which people talk about what the region should look like in 10 or 15 or 20 years and use that as the basis for the plan and continuously renew it. That kind of conversation is the only real democratic way that we see that regions can establish their priorities and um, uh, carry them out. The second C in regional collaboration is connection. Uh, you see that in lots of different ways. In modern innovative economies, you see it because innovation occurs not at the center of old disciplines, but at the intersection of disciplines. 
biotechnology. You've heard that term. Those are two disciplines. In the modern world, if you're going to compete, you have to have connections. And there are various forms of those connections. Um, and I was struck by something Greg said. He said, you know, we're not the only connector. We're not the only uh, organization uh, that's regionally active here. Uh, the important point is that all of them are connected to one another. And then finally, the third C of regional collaboration is capacity. You have to build your capacity, and most capacity, when you think about it, is regional. Some of the ones are obvious, transportation and the, and the logistics infrastructure, broadband. The mayor of Grand Rapids, how, I don't know the man, however good he is, is not going to solve the energy problem. That's a regional problem. Water is a regional problem. So when you think about it, regions are increasingly important for developing and improving economic capacity. I mentioned earlier this issue of a regional identity. Uh, I want to give you another example. You know your own pretty well. When I say the word Rochester, New York, or the words, most people would probably think Kodak, right? Rochester's been trying to shed that identity. Why? Because when you think about Kodak now, you think about a company that's lost 90% of its employees in the last 10 years. In other words, they don't want people thinking about Rochester as a declining place and the home of a declining industry. So they had to work very, very hard as a regional leadership body, and it was partly the Wired group that did that, to do invent or to devise and disseminate a new story. Their new story is that Rochester is the home of high technologies, right? And they have lots of evidence for that. But that's their new story. And regional leadership is critical to being able to tell the region's story, both to the people in the region and outside of the region. The second task of, of regional leadership as compared to other kinds of leadership is getting the right people at the table and getting them to do the right thing. It's, you know, again, I'll use Rochester as an example because I was recently there. Um, we did a study for Rochester and uh, we did a, a survey of 1,500 business people and then we did a, um, a series of interviews. Uh, we asked them about, well, how was the place collaborating? And they said, well, they're doing a really good job at getting people to sit around the table, to get around the table together. The problem is they don't have anything to show for it. So it's important to understand that just getting people around the table is not collaboration. Collaboration means getting around the table and getting them to agree to do something and then doing it. New regional rules of the game, what are we talking about? Well, the old regional rules of the game were that there weren't any, right? That towns would compete with one another um, to the detriment of each of them if they were trying to get industry to try to attract companies or trying to get companies to expand, because what would happen? Well, the local economic developers who are, whose incentives are to create jobs would go and tell a prospective company, don't go there, they have the following things wrong with them. Come here, we're great, right? Well, if you're a company visiting a region and you go to five different places and all of them are telling you what's wrong with the other guy, what are you gonna conclude, right? This place is a really bad place to locate, right? So let me give you an example of a new regional rule of the game, which is Denver, Colorado. In Denver, <coughs> excuse me, um, the regions around Denver decided that, that what they would do is come together and do all of their recruitment as a group. Uh, their, their basic new regional rule of the game was you could talk about the positives of your place but not the negatives of anybody else's. And they devised a code of ethics and they even put economic developers and others on trial when they violate the code of ethics. What's been the result? A 25% increase in recruitment over the last 10 years. Why? Because the same company that came to a region where there was all this fighting and all this cognitive dissonance goes to Denver and what do they hear? Nothing but positive things, right? So uh, we call this new rule of the game co-optition. 
right? You have to be able to compete and cooperate. This is a term that was coined in the, in the Silicon Valley, uh, and it absolutely applies to regionalism. Uh, well, you know, this one speaks for itself here. We've, we've spoken uh, about that. Um, there's something called the Index of the Silicon Valley, which I mentioned earlier, that comes out annually. West Michigan Vital Signs comes out annually. Uh, you need to tie decisions to measurement, because if you don't do that, you don't know what you have at the end, um, or as they say, without a map, any road will do. I'm really glad I came here today because I learned something new from Greg about this region. Uh, we had written about, well, regional leaders leadership has to show regional value. Why is it in your interest uh, to act like a region? Well, what do I hear? I hear that you've begun a project uh, of joint purchasing, uh, that if it's successful, and it sounds like it's on the way to being successful, government counties are going to save 25, 20 percent of uh, their funds for <clears throat> on, on their purchases. That's regional value. That's what leadership has to do. Going back to this point that regionalism is an unnatural act. All right, build an innovation ecosystem. I want to read you something about one of our global competitors, which explains why it is that we have to do better than we're doing. Uh, I use the example of Singapore, which is the size of a region, although it's a country. Um, it therefore doesn't have some of the concerns that uh, I talked about earlier about not having a, a government um, infrastructure. But I want to use the example of what they do and what we're up against when you start thinking about how we're going to have to be, compete effectively globally. They put together something called hotspots. Uh, the aim is to boost the, they call techno entrepreneurship, technopreneurship, some kind of combination of entrepreneurship and technology I can't manage to pronounce, uh, uh, by linking up their uh, new technology entrepreneurs, their established companies, uh, and all the support elements in one place. So a hotspot represents an, uh, a tie-in between Singapore's biggest names in, in the property arena, aligned with the academic community, aligned with venture capital, aligned with the Economic Development Corporation, the Housing Corporation, and the National University, and so on and so on. In other words, what you have them doing, and what you, why we call it an ecosystem, is they link all the elements that, in this case, technology-based startups need to succeed. What do they need? They need venture capitalists, right? They need marketing people, they need patent lawyers, they need all these things. And what they've done is put them in place so that you have an infrastructure for technological startups. So when we talk about building an, e an innovation ecosystem, that's what we mean. And, and George mentioned for, uh, earlier about the need for having venture capital. Uh, I would add uh, angel capital would be something else that you need to think about. And in addition, another element of an innovation ecosystem is what we call an ongoing intermediary organization, an economic development intermediary organization, a WMSA. The, it's not good enough in a region to say, well, we want to collaborate, so let's work on this project, and then we'll work on that project. This is an ongoing process. So you ask yourself the question, who calls the next meeting? Who takes the notes? Who finds the place to have the meeting? All these activities that are required to have an ongoing regional organization need something at its core. In this particular case, it's WMSA. But without it, what you have is just a series of spontaneous actions which basically are not built on a plan. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what we think are the lessons of uh, regional leadership. When we were doing this, we had a lot of internal conversations and, and in fact, arguments. Uh, some of our folks said, we have to give these folks out there instructions. We have to give them prescriptions. Others of us, which would include me, said, no, regional leadership, like, like regional growth strategies, is not a one-size-fits-all proposition. There are different forms of regional leadership. There's not a lot of WMSAs 
in the country, but there are a lot of leadership organizations which take different forms. So you have to figure out what works for your region and what your assets are. Um, why? Because as I said before, if you're really gonna compete in a global economy, regions have to act like regions, not regions cage, not places involved in a cage fight. Uh, Another lesson was when I cited that we learned directly from you all is this notion of a regional identity. A regional identity is not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing awareness building process. Uh, and then the final thing that we really figured out, partly from talking to Greg, partly from other places, is if you wanna be prescriptive, here's our one prescription. Don't just stand there, do something, anything. What does that mean? It essentially means that trust and unity is built through action, not through getting the right people at the table talking, right? WMSA is a good example of that. All the regions that we studied are good examples of that because what happens is actions beget actions. People learn to trust each other and they get to a higher level of action. More people kind of come out of the shadows in the woodwork who are interested in what you're doing and you start to build your organization. So too many places around the country are stuck at, you know, uh, on the monopoly board on, uh, you know, the go, right? And they just stay there. There's really very little risk in doing something because even if you're doing the wrong thing, you're bringing people together uh, and hopefully allowing them to build up their organizations. Uh, I just want to close by saying how much of an honor it is for me and for the council to be here. Uh, we may not have done a best practices study, but the fact of the matter is you are one of the models that people around the country look to and uh, on the part of the Council on Competitiveness, uh, I want to wish you the best of luck and I urge you to keep on doing the right thing. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we appreciate your uh, coming out to uh, visit us in West Michigan. Um, it's always good to hear from somebody inside the Beltline that sanity still resides here in West Michigan and that we are doing the right kinds of things, so we appreciate the comments. Um, this kind of program doesn't happen without the, the effort of a lot of people. Uh, this is the team uh, that makes up West Michigan Strategic Alliance. Uh, I can't say enough about each of the people that are part of the team. Uh, we work day and night. Uh, don't always get paid a lot for what we're doing, but the effort's one that we all love. I tell people at my age to be able to do the things that I'm doing and working on the kinds of projects that I am, it's, it's too exciting for me and, and I can't think of a better way uh, to help our region become the best place, to, a best place to live, work, and play. And I thank all of the members of the team that make that happen for us every day. If you want to stay connected with us, uh, we're trying to be socially connected in all of the ways that people need to be communicated to. I'm still trying to learn how to Twitter, uh, but I'm getting there. And uh, for those of you that know how to do that, uh, I'm willing to be receptive to seeking some help and advice and counsel. Uh, lastly, um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, hopefully what you walk away from uh, the meeting with is that we do have a good sense of who we are. And with your input, we have a good sense of what needs to be done. We do understand that we need to compete and we'll only compete if we act as a region. It's the only way for us to successfully leverage all of the resources that need to be put in place to make sure that this is the right place for investment. Uh, also, we need to seize the opportunity. It's, it's no longer acceptable for us to accept status quo. Uh, it is time for us to really rethink what we do. We're in an economic transformation we need to drive the process, we need to hold ourselves accountable, and we do need to achieve results. I was looking, when I was looking at the environmental, and I looked at the uh, type two solid waste that we used to deal with, tw almost 12 pounds per person per day of waste, five or six years ago. We've cut that in half, uh, but we still, that's five, we're still doing five pounds of waste per person per day that's gotta go somewhere. We gotta figure this out. Uh, we did a study to look at uh, what to deal with solid waste and how to deal with recycling. It's one of those things that you rated highly as something we should work on. It's the kind of sustainable process that we need to actually adopt and put in place so we can be leaders. I know George uh, 
the mayor, what's Norm, what's Hartwell. the last name? Hartwell. Hartwell, jeez. At my age, you also have these moments, too, of blankness, you know? <laughs> I know when, uh, when I first uh, met George Hartwell, and he said, we're going to be an alternative energy city, and we're going to use green power. And I come from the energy business, so I was a little skeptical of George's comments. But I can tell you, it's the leadership of somebody like George saying, we can achieve this. We can find ways to purchase green power. It can be competitive. It can be part of a sustainable mix. And we ought to be doing the same thing as it relates to solid waste and all of the other challenges that we, we face. The data helps us understand what the issues are. We need you in the room to act on it and to seize the opportunity to make a difference. And lastly, we need to take action. We will build partnerships based on trust because we're taking action to deal with real problems, to bring real, re, real value to our region. Uh, I can't thank all of you enough for your participation today. I can't thank you for what you do for us day in and day out to make our region a best place to live, work, and work and play. People are paying attention to what's going on in West Michigan. Uh, Sam's evidence of that fact. Now we just need to continue to do the right thing. So have a great day. Appreciate your time and support. Uh, the reception will be held in this room, and I think the food and whatnot's behind us. So take care. Good job.